Recently, of course, as everyone knows, China announced uh, uh, its work on a massive hydropower project as part of its fourth uh, five-year plan in Medog County of Tibet. And in the last week of November 2020, the president of the Power Construction Corporation of China, which is a Chinese government company, announced plans to develop a hydropower project of mammoth proportions of up to 60 gigawatts. Uh, on the lower reaches of the Yarlung Zangpo River, which of course in India is known as Siang and uh, Brahmaputra, uh, the Chinese of course says that you know it will help the country realize its peak carbon emission before 2030 and combined carbon neutrality before 2060, and will help you know the nation to transition to into a green economy. But India has its share concerns of these dams being used as water well. Affair and uh, for political leverage, uh, these issues have been going on for some time. India and China do not have, as of now, any bilateral agreement uh, on water. Of course, there is an agreement regarding sharing of data, for which India also pays China. But beyond that, you know, there is no comprehensive uh, agreement between India and China with regards to the river or with regards to hydropower. Uh, At this point of time, I think I would like to uh, go to the panelists. We have a fantastic panel today. Uh, we have, of course, the Honorable Mr. Ninong Erin, uh, who, of course, right now is a member of the Legislative Assembly uh, in Arunachal Pradesh, former Union Minister, former Deputy Speaker of the Arunachal Pradesh Legislative Assembly. We have Dr. Shriparna Patak of uh, the Jindal School of International Affairs. Uh, she has a PhD. Uh, on Chinese uh, studies from the Center of East Asian Studies in JNU, we have uh, Dr. Dhanshri Jairam from Manipal. We also have Dr. Ivan Ellis, who is a research professor focusing on Latin American studies at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute, with a focus on the region's relationship with China. And we have, of course, Ranju Dodum, who is a senior journalist from the Donlit Post. Um, I would like to now do a detailed introduction. Uh, I would like to actually now hand over, you know, the 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 mic to Honorable Mr. Ering to give his opening remarks and share his thoughts regarding where we are and where does he see this issue going. You know, considering the fact that he comes from a comes from the strategic state of Arunachal Pradesh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored and. You know, I have the pleasure of having such a vast, uh, knowledgeable uh, panelist. Of course, uh, Mr. Ivan also from the U.S. It's nice that to uh, have you with us. I'm sorry, my uh, video is not coming because now you can now know what problems we have in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, this is Pasigat, and in Pasigat uh, we are not uh, having. A, uh, we have a uh, internet issue. And uh, uh, the mobile uh, system here is pretty bad. Now we have the BSNL, we have the Airtel, we have the Jio, but even in a place like Pasigat, uh, we have this problem. So I'm sorry, uh, my uh, video uh, I cannot get to you. But all the <clears throat> same, uh, I hope that you all are hearing me, and uh, I really am. A Concern about this uh, Siang River, which we call Siang, but uh, downstream it is known as the Brahmaputra, uh, which flows into the Bangladesh. Uh, Brahmaputra or Siang or Sangpo in China is uh, one of the longest rivers and one of the most uh, <clears throat> uh, fast-flowing rivers. It has got. It comes from very high gorges, and then when it enters into Arunachal Pradesh, we have Uh, great five rapids, which uh, even the people go and take a challenge. Uh, controlling this river, especially in the summer, is very difficult. I have always raised this issue in Parliament, or even outside the Parliament. Uh, since the, uh, I think it must be about two thousand twenty, two thousand. Seventeen, eighteen. Then also it was there, but the main flood was in two thousand one. There was a very devastating flood, uh, which gave a lot of uh, 
<clears throat> it was very devastating and about uh, we we lost a lot of lives we lot of a uh, lo lot of uh, cattle uh, land was destroyed and eroded and even to this day we are having this issue of uh, erosion of the land this i think is because of the the dams that have been made constructed in the upper regions of uh, tibet now china and because of that accumulation of silt in those dams when they release it uh, it comes downstream and now it is causing this havoc here as you must all know of course i won't give in details about the yarlung zangfo because there's so many rivers that join into it like there's small small tributaries like shapchu nayangchu rangchu yarlingchu uh, shangchu kyushu so all these rivers and we also have these rivers like yamna we have simang we have siam we have when all these rivers come down then it makes this mighty siang and downstream it becomes the brahmaputra the yarlung zangfo was uh, explored in the year i think uh, 1884 to 86 that's the period when the explorers had seen that uh, there there this about this very famous river tibet was of course that time not under the occupation of china because only after 1959 when the his holiness the dalai lama had uh, come to india through tawang uh, since then uh, we have known about uh, the chinese existence before we had trade relations with tibet and uh, our people especially on the borders in right from uh, limiking taxing or uh, in uh, tawang or in uh, mechuka or even in uh, the northern part of our siang uh, that is where that uh, the river enters into arunachal pradesh that is bising uh, this is a, this is the last village of arunachal pradesh this is the last village from where the chinese had uh, Uh, intruded in uh, Geiling, 1962 war, and even in Bising, they have uh, intruded just uh, about uh, four years back, in which uh, I had to even raise this issue in Parliament also. So the Chinese are always up to their, you know, their uh, kind of uh, occupation tactics, aggressive and aggression tactics. So this river is going to give a very big threat to us. in the last flood that we had when the water had turned completely black black uh, must be about 2000 uh, to uh, to 2017 18 that's a period when the whole siang river turned black it it uh, destroyed all the flora fauna the marine life was completely destroyed all the fishes were dead even the uh, farmers or the fishermen Uh, had to face a lot of problems they could not uh, control the water this was so brackish that uh, we had to get teams from uh, uh, the from delhi or even from bangalore uh, they came and visited and they uh, saw the condition of that uh, river so now the main issue is that what happens to the northern part of the siang the panelists also, of course will also explain or you must be knowing more about it because we don't know what is going on in china the number of dams they are constructed the on the main tributaries they have constructed about four dams which are very big dams which are affecting the downstream regions of arunachal pradesh and also assam but it is learned or through here savius learning there are more than hundreds of dams which have been controlled concerning the small 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 regions of the small small, small tributaries of the sangpo so once these rivers at one go it is like a water bomb so it's a very big threat to us construction of dams we will not object to that because this is their land they were right to that to construct those dams and they are there when you have the potential of uh, generating this uh, we should also not object because all the 
uh, other small uh, even countries like Bhutan also they are completely dependent on that uh, uh, on the power generation. India and China, even in the uh, during the Panchil, uh, you know, discussion, they had uh, about the MacMahon line that is along the boundaries. There were there were a lot of arrangements and a lot of agreements, but we have never ever come to uh, agreement about uh, the uh, water issue about the sharing of the waters. So we are now at a back foot. Arunachal Pradesh is a back foot because we we cannot now say, because we have not constructed the dams, so we cannot say the what China has to do about this recent uh, construction of this dam. But only on a political level, we can uh, raise our voice or on a diplomatic level, we can raise our voice because this dam which is going to come up, it is going to be a very big dam which will uh, dispropriate the system out here in Arunachal Pradesh or even in Assam or even to Bangladesh. Because once this dam is con constructed, the water flow will be contained there. And there are chances, like uh, in the Global Times they had said, that they would divert this river through tunnels into the Xinjiang province that is in the Yunnan China in the southern, they call it the southern, uh, southern eastern part of China, where into uh, through Arunachal and flows into the Assam, then it is termed as a Brahmaputra. So these issues we have to consider, we have to take up. I have raised the issue several times. So in all the discussions, I have always objected that China is, because this is a kind of policy, it will be a very big threat to Arunachal. Suppose they construct this dam and they release the water at a particular time, the amount of silt that will be brought, the amount of water, the volume of water, especially if it is released in summer, then most of the uh, areas of Arunachal Pradesh will be inundated. Like in the 2001 flood, all the bridges, all the roads were all washed away. So there has to be kind of a study. Of course, the, uh, the union government has said that we are sharing the knowledge of the water flow of between uh, the Sangpo and uh, Siang or the Brahmaputra. But this will not suffice because if there is an emergency, what are the yardsticks that we have to maintain? What is the amount of uh, construction of the dams that they are making? We had all Pros and cons we can discuss later or I can take it up in my uh, question. I think I've taken enough time. But the main object of ours now is the construction of this mega dam, which is going to be constructed just about 50 kilometers from Gailing and Basing. This is going really a big threat to us. And I would like the union government and also the people who are abroad, uh, outside of India also, that would support the cause of Arunachal Pradesh, especially uh, that of uh, the people of Arunachal Pradesh and the downstream people living on this Siang belt, that they must raise their voice and say that, okay, uh, this is enough, and uh, the downstream people also have a right to live. And uh, the, the flora, the fauna that has been destroyed, which has been affected, uh, we don't want Arunachal Pradesh or the Assam or Bangladesh to become a desert. Because once the river is diverted, means the, even the, uh, the, the height of the river when it goes down, because it is coming from a tremendous height, 
So that is the re uh, reason that the re water penetrates through the hills and they come out as other streams or rivulets or even as small rivers. But once this river is diverted, then the whole uh, the water level will go down and I don't think that we will have any kind of a, a river in future. So we don't want to become a desert and I would request uh, the central government to at least take an initiative to uh, stop this dam. Otherwise, uh, Arunachal Pradesh, we may even have to uh, say that we'll become a desert and it'll be very unfortunate for all of us. So we, I'll, this, I'll participate the discussion later also, but I would like to hear from the others also what they wish to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ehring, you know, for your thoughts. Very important points, of course, regarding the water bomb and the need to form an international coalition to engage China on this particular matter and also to initiate steps on our side of the border to check, you know, the expansion. Uh, yes. At this point of time, I would like yes. to introduce uh, Dr. Professor Ivan Ellis, who is a research professor of Latin American Studies at the United States Army War College Strategic Studies Institute uh, with a special focus on the region's relationship with China and other non-Western Hemisphere actors as well as transnational organized crime and populism in the region. Dr. Ellis previously served on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff with responsibility for Latin America and the Caribbean as well as international narcotics and law enforcement issues. In his academic capacity, Dr. Ellis presented his work uh, on a broad range of business and government forums in 27 countries on four continents. He has given testimony on the Latin American security issues to the US Congress on various occasions, has discussed his work regarding China and other external actors in Latin America on a broad range of radio and television programs, and is cited regularly in the print media in both the United States and Latin America for his work in the area. Dr. Ellis has been awarded the Order of Military Merit, Joy Maria Cordova, by the Colombian government on security issues in the region. Uh, I would like to, to welcome Dr. Ellis uh, into the um, into the discussion and would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Ellis to offer his comments on this issue and then of course we'll take it forward from there. Dr. Ellis, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, it's an honor for me to be able to be part of this uh, discussion and to share my work and perspectives uh, with the group. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, although I'm uh, currently the research professor with the U.S. Army War College and uh, previously been on the, the policy planning staff for the Secretary of State, nuclear, etc. Um, so one of the issues, of course, is that China has a limited amount of hydropower potential in its own country. And so um, as it's gone out and looked at the uh, allies, you have, um, you know, Belt and Road Initiative hydropower projects outside of China as well. And frankly, other projects which are not directly contributing to the, the Chinese power grid, but contributing to the work um, and, and technical knowledge of, of its company. Companies. So when we talk about Latin America, we're really talking about uh, that category. But overall, um, one recent estimate is about 320 plus overseas projects that the Chinese companies have, um, representing about 81 gigawatts of installed capacity in 68 different countries uh, to date. So of that, Latin America is relatively a modest quantity. Um, I track uh, 18 major hydropower projects uh, in Latin America. Um, some of the big actors, of course, are, are Sino Hydro and the Gazuga Group in, in Latin America, but uh, certainly not the only ones. Um, but as China looks abroad, what it finds is a number of different obstacles. And so um, whereas uh, Chinese companies have a certain amount of latitude, as you've already alluded to, in doing these projects in China, um, as it has to deal with um, foreign governments and foreign soil, uh, there are, you know, especially in democracies, it has restrictions in access to land, dealing with local communities, environmental complications, labor, etc. 
So in Latin America and the Caribbean, what you see is that, um, first of all, it's a mixture. It's not just building uh, facilities, but also uh, China as it's uh, acquired different electricity uh, generation and transmission capabilities has acquired um, and it's had to manage hydro facilities. Uh, usually this turns out better than for China than the process of, of building and constructing. But uh, in, in general, um, these projects, uh, especially when they're built, end up leveraging uh, the financing of Chinese policy banks, uh, you know, um, as, as well as the um, use of uh, Chinese construction uh, companies, workers, and, and equipment. Uh, oftentimes, also, it's not just a question of transmit of generation, but also uh, transmission. Um, sometimes solely a question of transmission, as we saw, as we'll see in uh, Brazil's uh, Belo Monte Dam uh, project. Um, in addition, um, overall, looking at Latin America, and I'll go into a few details in, in just a minute, but um, it's actually striking that of the 18 projects that uh, I'm, I'm tracking across the region, um, virtually every single one, almost without exception, has run into one problem or not. Um, and actually, very few of them have been fully completed. Um, those who have been completed have been completed with many, many different problems. And the categories of problems include uh, security affecting Chinese workers from the local context, um, labor and safety issues, environmental issues, um, strikes, uh, pushback from local communities about the environmental impact, uh, poor project performance that have caused, in some cases, Chinese companies to be actually removed uh, from that. So just to, to go across the board, I just want to kind of paint a panorama. Uh, so, um, so, so for example, when we look at Peru, um, that is probably one of the cases where China has done best. Um, but both of the major projects in Peru have been uh, inherited by China and not built by itself. Um, the, uh, the the Chagya Dam, about a 456 kilowatt dam, which it acquired uh, from the uh, uh, construction company Odebrecht, as well as the uh, San Gaban project, which is still in, in progress. But um, that actually also came through the, uh, the acquisition of uh, Lustil. Um, when you look at Bolivia, there are three major hydro projects, um, Rositas, Nisikuni, and San Jose. Um, every, all three of those projects have actually been stopped and have had uh, you know, strikes and, and difficulties, including the San Jose project, uh, which has been paralyzed since uh, 2016 um, because of, of, of labor issues. Uh, in Ecuador, um, and this has been uh, somewhat of a high profile uh, issue in the United States, there are eight different hydro projects, uh, largely because of the collaboration of the previous government, uh, um, the leftist populist government of Rafael Correa um, with the PRC. But of all of those eight, um, there have been problems with all, and three of them were actually taken away by the Ecuadorian government. So the one that was completed, inaugurated technically in 2016, Coca-Cola Sinclair, um, that was a, a 1.5 gigawatt project. But um, a German audit registered about 400 different deficiencies, and there are a lot of issues with both the corruption involved in, in the project that the current government is still trying to sort out, as well as uh, um, trying to get the Chinese to correct the, the deficiencies. Um, there is also a number of safety projects, uh, problems, including a December uh, 2014 very sad incident in which, uh, with the collapse of a pressure well, uh, 14 different uh, uh, workers were, were killed. Uh, the Tuachi Pilatone project, also in Ecuador, um, you actually had, again, um, that had to be canceled and taken from the Chinese company in, in 2016 and given actually to a Russian company, uh, uh, Tazmayev, for uh, non-performance. Um, other examples, uh, the Mazarduda complex, uh, uh, they ran into geological problems and the, the company, China National Electric Equipment Corporation, uh, they had to terminate the contract because of non-compliance. Another one, Kiko, is also terminated for, for non-compliance. Um, in Argentina, two projects on the Santa Cruz River, um, uh, which uh, impacted a very historic uh, and, and uh, environmentally significant uh, glacial field. Uh, that was uh, run by the Gazuba Group. Um, that was actually stopped in 2016 by an order of the Argentine uh, Supreme Court, um, in, in part because of the environmental impacts that were not addressed by it and the studies were not done properly. Uh, also, it, it turned out that the local partner, because these are often dealing with local partners, Electra and Enajaria, um, the head of that was implicated in a in a bribery and corruption case, something called the Cuadernos uh, case in in Argentina. Um, although, interestingly enough, the way the Chinese structured the deal using something called a cross default clause, the project survived because if they canceled the project, China would have taken away funding from a different railroad project of, of importance to the Argentine government. And so, with the new leftist government in, in Argentina of Cristina and Alberto uh, Kirchner, um, the project ironically is back on track despite the environmental issues. 
decision in a previous court ruling. In Chile, a project called Hydra Ison. In Patagonia, also again, a, a very environmentally delicate place. Um, in Chile, where you have a vibrant democracy and um, an, an active uh, bureaucratic oversight, um, this, this project Hydra Ison uh, was uh, the subject to a lot of pushback, especially because it would have flooded a great deal of, of indigenous land, uh, affected the Mapuche and others. Um, and uh, so um, that was technically canceled in 2014, although the current government is, is looking at it in a new way. Um, Mexico, uh, Chiclasen II, again, um, the interesting thing there is the project is going forward, although very, very slowly, um, in, in part because it seems that there is a special relationship with the Mexican, the leftist Mexican government of Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador when other projects uh, have not. Honduras, two major projects, uh, the Petucha 3 Dam, uh, it was stopped for a while because of violence. It, it, apparently there was uh, some uh, gold to be had, some illegal mining in, in the area. Um, and so there was a lot of pushback, some of it um, kind of improper by, by the local communities. Um, but that project ended up being completed after the, the significant uh, violence that, that, that took place. Um, different story in the a smaller project, Aquazarca. Um, in the case of Aquazarca, there was a, an indigenous group called the Lenca there who were being affected. Um, in that case, actually, Sino Hydro withdrew from the project, uh, again, because of indigenous pushback and, and difficulties, although a later consortium um, pressed forward with a, a redesigned version of, of the project. Um, and then there are other examples. Of, for example, there's a project called Amila Falls in, in Guyana that um, the local partner, uh, Scythe Global, actually pulled out of the project in 2015, forcing it to be to be stopped. That was by uh, China Railway Group, was, was the, the Chinese partner. Um, but uh, it, it, that was interesting because again there were improper studies in the adequacy of, of the water that was done there with the um with, with the local uh, river involved the uh, Kurobong river um and in the end of the day um uh, there's some talk that the new uh, ppp government uh, the basically the the indo guyanese government may, may bring it back so again um just some details but it's striking that across the board it's it's almost impossible to find a project in latin america that the chinese companies have been working that have not had one type of problem or another, and, and actually very few that have been successfully completed, in part because of, you know, the democratic context in which they're trying to do that work. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share, and I look forward to the questions and answers. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ivan, uh, for your thoughts. Uh, I now uh, would like to introduce uh, Dr. Sriparna Patak. Uh, Dr. Patak is right now the assistant professor and uh, the assistant dean, academic dean of the Jindal School of International Affairs. Uh, she holds a PhD uh, in Chinese studies from the Center for East Asian Studies at the School of International Affairs, uh, Jahalal Nehru University. Uh, she was uh, a member of the governing council of the Center for Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian Studies uh, in Guwahati University. Uh, she was also a fellow at South Asia Democratic Forum and also a visiting fellow at the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, uh, Kathmandu. Uh, she also served as a consultant uh, in the Policy Planning and Research Division at the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, Government of India in New Delhi. Uh, she has a range of publications and academic work to her credit. I would like to now hand over the mic to Dr. Patak to share her thoughts on the Chinese aggression uh, on the water issue uh, with regards to India and other countries. Dr. Patak. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gaurav. And thank you, Red Lantern Analytica, for uh, giving me the platform. Um, it's really... Um, it's, it's been long that India has been um, suffering because of China's hydrological uh, plans and policies. So this is an excellent um, time to um, have this webinar. Um, I'd quickly like to share content. If I could just, um, you know, share my slides, it would be great. I'll try to. I hope this, I, I hope this is showing up on your screen. So um, I'm going to speak briefly, and I, I hope I don't spill into the others' time. Um, I will speak on China's hydropower projects and um, the impacts on um, India so far. You know, the relationship between India and China, the two leaders of the so-called Asian century, has always been a complex one. It's generally called as a mix of cooperation and conflict. 
But 2020 did away the inclinations towards cooperation as Chinese aggression at the borders revealed the true conflictual nature of the relationship. Now, in addition to security, differences in approaches to non-traditional security challenges are also becoming the reason for this relationship becoming more conflictual. An important and additional arena for this conflict is that of water. Even though India and China inked a memorandum of understanding in June 2018 to share hydrological data or information, China has been using ecological frontiers such as the Tibetan Plateau and transboundary rivers such as the Brahmaputra as political tools. Now, um, during um, in 2017, during the 73-day uh, long Doklam standoff, China refused to share hydrological data with India, despite the fact that the two sides have a grievance regarding um, you know, sharing of hydrological data. China even charges India an annual fee of close to rupees 1 crore for the data. Now, sharing of hydrological data is extremely important for India's northeastern states. Um, in general, uh, Peqing provides India with the data from three particular stations. And these three hydrological stations are at Nugesha, Yangtsun, and Nungsia, which lie on the mainstream of the Brahmaputra River, and from the station at uh, Tsada for the Satlej River. However, in 2017, China cited technical difficulties for its inability to provide India with the data. Certain news reports share the data because the hydrological data gathering sites were washed away due to the floods. Some other reports stated that China could not share the data with India due to upgradation of data collection stations in Tibet. Of course, there's a huge gap between both these reasons. Um, <clears throat> the reason behind China's refusal to um, share hydrological data is more pol political in nature. In 2017, when in when china said that it cannot share this particular data you know it was unable to share this data with india the same data was received by bangladesh mufazzal hussein who's a member who was a member of the joint rivers commission of bangladesh he was quoted as saying that we have been receiving such data from the three hydrological stations in tibet since 2002 the hydrological stations which china claimed were being upgraded or were washed away due to floods Somehow they had been able to provide hydrological data to Bangladesh, but could not uh, provide the same data to India. Keeping in line with the existing agreements between India and China on data sharing, India had paid for the data in advance, but there's no um, mention of the refund of the advance paid um, in any primary or secondary resources which I've studied so far. Now, this is just one example from recent history. Other um, other examples include the flash floods which wreaked havoc in Himachal Pradesh and Arunachal Pradesh between um, 2000 and 2005 and were linked to unannounced releases of, um, one second, there's some technological problem at my end. I'm sorry, I'll just take two seconds. Sorry. So, um, you know, the other examples were these uh, examples from Himachal Pradesh and Arunachal Pradesh between 2000 and 2005, when there was an unannounced release of water from rain swollen Chinese dams and barrels which were based, uh, uh, you know, on the... Recently, as has been um, pointed out, what had happened in 2017 was that uh, the Siang River or the Yarlung Sangpo, which later on becomes the Brahmaputra, um, it reported blackening of water. It reported high turbidity and iron levels, so much so that fishes died and the river was deemed to pollute. The sea flows down to the uh, Tibetan Plateau into Arunachal Pradesh, which, which and you know it joins the Lohit and Dibang downstream in order to become the Brahmaputra. There were multiple analyses for the blackening of the river, and one of these analyses even stated that the cause was an earthquake in Tibet. But the fact remains that there was human-made destruction in China. Satellite imagery from um, December 2017 shows the Brahmaputra River disappearing into a 900 meters long tunnel in China and polymer resin adhesives being sprayed all around the area by China. Polymer resin adhesives act as a dust suppressant and are used for large 
construction projects but are never used near water since the resin adhesives are harmful to animal and human life now this was the reason behind the crisis in the siang river downstream however china's um, state run global times declared that arunachal pradesh is a part of china there's no question of china polluting its own rivers in this case china not only used the river for its own selfish interests but actually created hazardous situations for human life and ecology um and this pronouncement through the global times it just reiterated you know china's claim over arunachal pradesh even though the issue at hand was of river water sharing and not of um you know territorial disputes per se in each and every instance water becomes a tool of china's aggressive politics on the issue of hydrological data in any case what is received from china does not detail the place and the time of recording thereby limiting india's or bangladesh's scope for detecting detecting any upstream diversion now let's cut to you know 2020 2021 in december 2020 it was reported that china plans to build this hydro power project on the brahmaputra and of course this has concerned um, uh, this has triggered concerns in both india and in bangladesh china's plans for dams along tibetan waterways are well documented these are central to national economic and energy development priorities the state run communist you daily it boasted of the irrigation benefits which will be brought by this uh, siapuchu project um and the state council um, you know it talked about bus which is known as tibet's bread basket further as one of china's most impoverished regions improving flood control and supporting electricity production in tibet it forms a central part of xi jinping's anti poverty legacy this is there on one hand but then there are vulnerable communities outside china's borders and uh, these communities have become increasingly concerned and with good reason to safeguard its own interests india has announced its own plans to construct a multipurpose reservoir in arunachal pradesh to offset the impact of the dam on the chinese side the question here is why is china's weaponization of water so worrisome the reason as to why china's um, you know weaponization of water is so worrisome comes from this quote from uh, sun zu who had compared what and the army you know he and i quote the nature of water is such that it avoids heights and hastens to the lowlands when a dam is broken the water cascades with irresistible force now the shape of an army resembles water take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness attack him when he does not expect it avoid his strength and strike his emptiness like water no one can oppose you so uh, the potency of water as a weapon was clearly stated a long time ago in china over the years china has made huge investments in building dams it has avoided entering into any water sharing agreement with downstream countries like india china completed the zangmo dam which has about 510 megawatt capacity uh, which was built on the upper reaches of the brahmaputra in 2010 three more dams one at uh, taku which is of 640 megawatts one at chiacha which is of 320 megawatts and at uh, chieshu are currently under construction the work on zam hydropower station which will be the largest dam on brahmaputra commenced in 2015 um earlier this year a us government funded study showed that a series of new dams are being and this had worsened the drought situation um in the downstream countries of course china disputed the findings fact stands that in 2017 vietnam pleaded with china to release water from the yunnan dam into the mekong river in this instance china complied and waters flowed into cambodia laos and myanmar and thailand and vietnam however the drought had clearly damaged some uh, 140000 hectares of rice in the mekong delta 2000 people faced water shortages now chinese media has been reporting that the country is planning to implement this um beautiful hydropower exploitation in the downstream yarlung sangpo or the brahmaputra or the siang as we know it um this but naturally is very some for india and bangladesh why china has not been forthright about its construction of dams and hardly gives any information on the projects or its long term plans a case in point is from 2010 when after several years of denial peiching finally admitted that it's building the zangmo dam on the brahmaputra 
the dams built by china are large enough to be stored to be turned into storage dams which will allow it to manipulate water resources freely for flood control or for irrigation now in such a scenario china can potentially deprive india of water during the dry season or flood um, the way assam got flooded in 2017 and energy centric geopolitical tensions these projects have a cascading impact on the environment um the ex- this 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 impact on the environment comes from this dam within china itself um which is the three gorges dam which is the world's largest hydroelectric dam which was built in 2003 to block the yangtze river and uh, there was an earthquake <clears throat> because of you know um, the kind of ecological destruction that had happened during the construction the brahmaputra flows through rugged himalayan topography which is ecologically vulnerable it's seismically active and the last major earthquake in the region was not too long ago in 2015 in nepal causing 9000 deaths massive infrastructural damage the region is highly vulnerable to earthquakes um and the next one potentially could take place anytime a large number of hydropower plants based on the run of the river system um used to generate electricity will definitely have repercussions interrupting the natural flow of water to generate energy will have a devastating impact which then becomes a major contributing factor to earthquakes and landslides dams constructed in the region can cause landslides or glacial slides um as well as cause you know dam induced earthquakes the deforestation um to create these dams also acts as a contributing force so um as i stated earlier to safeguard itself india is just planning a multipurpose 10000 megawatt hydropower project in arunachal pradesh but in addition to this what could india possibly do in the absence of international agreements binding china to transboundary river water sharing india's options are very limited however it's time that india start strategic asset and while renegotiating treaties on hydrological data sharing india at least puts forth a clause for payment post receipt of data india also needs to point out the necessity that the necessity of the data having important specifications such as time date and place of recording beyond all of these india needs to strengthen its own satellite systems enabling it to monitor upstream um, river conditions which will reduce the reliance on china which clearly is using the water as a geopolitical tool for arm twisting satellite imagery of china destroying ecological habitats needs to be a part of india's narrative at the highest levels of climate talks china's false narratives based on information concealment or falsehoods you know which are created after much planning these are all part of psychological warfare and india needs to take cognizance of this um and therefore india needs to actually showcase um, facts to the international community as to how big a threat chinese construction activities can actually be to human kind um with that i come to the end and uh, thank you so much for your um uh over to you mr gorov uh thank you uh, dr pat thank you so much uh, for your detailed uh, and very insightful presentation i would like to now uh introduce uh, our next speaker who is a senior journalist from the national times mr anju dodum uh mr dodum i hope you are here uh i think uh, he is having some network issues uh okay we will now uh, i think we'll just wait for a minute just in case you can connect with us hi hello uh, hello sir hello sir welcome welcome and uh, would like to know your thoughts since you know you're a practicing journalist uh in arunachal uh, and you have some experience at the ground on the devastation that uh, china can cause uh, because of its uh, hydrological war okay. would like to sh- would like you to share your thoughts on this particular issue and what do you sense on the ground do you see people and the masses also collectively coming together to oppose this and how do we uh, you know assess this 
Yeah, first of all, uh, very good evening to everyone and thank you uh, for having me here. Um, considering, you know, I was actually going through the list of all the other panelists and speakers and I was wondering, what am I doing here? You know, this is such an esteemed panel. But uh, since I have been asked uh, to here, come here and I was actually very cleverly, I said, I will not speak first uh, so that uh, everyone else already puts forward their uh, their insight and their points. And I think uh, I think both, uh, I think, I'm sorry, um, all three of my previous uh, uh, co-panelists have already highlighted much of the issues uh, that 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 you know um, that occupies the the discussion when it comes to India and China and and, and hydropower. I think uh, my my point of view, my perspective of and and you know, this is not the first uh, discussion that I have been part of when it comes to discussing hydropower and 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 China and inter and transnational waters. Um, and it's always it's always us, you know. It's always uh, from 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 what I can gather, from what I have seen. It's it's always us uh, in India, um, us including uh, our South Asian uh, colleagues who are part of such discussions. Um, we've hardly had discussions or with uh, you know with, with our Chinese colleagues, uh, be it Chinese officials, be it uh, be it uh, you know uh, water activists in in China. Um, and I think that's that that's where the problem lies with uh, with regards to the issue. Um, Conflict is natural. Uh, I think uh, we have seen water conflicts happen even within our country. Uh, when it comes to the Kaveri River, when it comes to uh, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, you know, even within the state, within the country, the states are unable to reach uh, an amicable solution that is, you know, that is satisfactory to all parties to last a long time. Conflict invariably happens, but but I think. To resolve any conflict, uh, discussion is the most important, the, the most important part. And unless that happens, um, we cannot actually resolve any of the issues. With regards to India and China, um, we, although we are here discussing at a macro level the the the, the Sangpo or the Siam or the Brahmaputra, um, we need to also look at things from a larger perspective of not just discussing the river, but the but the river basin, uh, the, the entire Brahmaputra basin. We need to look at it from the Eastern Himalayan biodiversity uh, hotspot. We need to look at it from the point of view of the Hindu Kush region. There are so many countries involved and are part of this entire region that there needs to be greater dialogue from, uh, sorry, uh, greater dialogue by and within parties, within all affected people, affected countries, they all need to come together to discuss these issues. I think the problem that we have seen and as you know, as uh, um, uh, as as uh, Dr. Patak and uh, and uh, our Honorable MP has already said that, you know, it's we, the only thing we can do what's happening to the Sangpo or the Brahmaputra or any in China, in, in Tibet and enter India is we can only speculate as to what's happening. We don't know for sure till now why the rivers of the Siang turned uh, turned turned black. Uh, we don't know for sure why the floods of 2000, 2000 happened in the Siang that caused so much devastation. And as uh, um, as Mr. Ering uh, mentioned, uh, so much uh, of erosion, so much of loss of lives and cattle. We still don't know why that happened. We are still speculating uh, that this could have been happened. This could have happened. Maybe you know. There are people who, who looked at analyzed uh, satellite images and said that there was um, there was a, a landslide in the upper reaches, which is what led to the uh, which is what led to the uh, to, uh, to 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 the waters of the Siang turning black. Or the other theory is that it happened because there is large scale hydropower construction happening. Now the problem is we don't know we don't know any of it. We, the only source of information that we have is the go Chinese government uh, uh, official propaganda outlets um, like the Global Times, which recently announced that, you know, that China is planning to build a massive, uh, uh, ma massive dam um, in uh, on the on the Sangpo. Now, that too, while that is something that was officially, I mean, well, at least officially in the sense that it came from a, a government mouthpiece, that it was announced. 
we are not entirely sure if that really is what the government is planning or is that just you know is is that is that just china calling uh, calling its bluff we 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 have no idea we have no idea if that's the truth we have no idea of how to even verify that information because uh, because china does not share information with its uh, well at least with with india it doesn't share you know uh, it 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 does have it did actually have a data sharing information a data sharing treaty with uh, with india with regards to the siam and how much um, distant so so the biggest issue that i see here is that that there is the complete uh, lack of uh, cooperation from the chinese side when it comes to uh, when it comes to these these matters it's only in trade that uh, the china seems to be open to dialogue everything else uh, you know there is a big there's a there's an actual firewall uh, there, there's a firewall and there's an actual great war uh, not on the northern side but on the, on the southern side when it comes to information sharing with with india so uh, from and from what from what i see um, from my time in the field talking to people writing stories uh, i think the biggest uh, the, the biggest sufferers are the people on the ground you know um, i'm here you know in my uh, in my comfortable apartment uh, talking about uh, issues that really directly do not have an impact on my life directly at least but my experiences on the field have shown me that it's the people in the villages it's people who are working really working for their livelihood on a daily basis um, you know people who don't have sundays or saturdays off or weekends off uh, people who have to till the land um, go to the river uh, f- for their uh, livelihoods those are the ones who are most affected and unfortunately from the indian side but from what i've noticed from our uh, and you know and i say when i say indian side i mean the government side is that the government has been uh, not very willing to engage with uh, with with locals who are not uh perceived or perceived to be not in line with the government's point of view um mr ering has you know he has been shouting at the top of his lungs ever since he was an mp uh and now he's an mla that you know that there needs to be uh, you know that we need to uh, discuss this issue with what's happening with the siang we need to find out we need to talk with the chinese and uh, you know successive governments be it the congress government or be it uh, you know the current uh, current dispensation it's it doesn't matter the government of india has been reluctant in and having open discussions about uh, about the siang about the about the sangpo about the brahmaputra with with the chinese and i think that is a major uh, cause of concern because the way the Ch- the indian government treats this river which is such a vital river for, for our country um, it can uh, have a negative impact on the perception that people uh, of the state have towards uh, the indian government that it, you know it comes off as being there's a there's a term that we use in in, in arunachal that you know that the center is always uh, meting out step motherly treatment uh, that's a term that's that's as often thrown about but when the indian government continues to ignore the voices of the people and it continues to sorry uh, in areas like like pasigar where 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 uh, flooding has become an annual event uh, it's not much reported as much as as much as the floods of assam are reported but uh, in in the downstream uh, areas of siang in, in pasigar in places like pasigar uh, places like merbo uh, flooding has become an annual event and it just is not reported as much or even if it is reported it's reported at a very hyper local level and doesn't get the attention that the uh the, the, that any uh, from the national from the so called national media that uh, that flooding in anywhere else would get first when when we write these these stories with the with uh, with the we have to always 
say that oh the chinese must be up to something that's why there is flooding happening that's why there is flooding in arunachal unless you know you mention china uh, arunachal doesn't get the space it deserves or the space it needs uh, in 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 uh, national media outlets so so that that that's a, that's a that's a major problem is uh, from from a journalist uh, journalistic point of view that that i have faced when it comes to you know highlighting these issues you know that everything has to be uh, presented from the point of view of delhi looking in instead of uh, instead of the perspective of us looking outwards those uh, i think uh, you know like i said um, i don't really have much to my much to add uh, unless there are specific uh, questions that that can be forwarded to me um like i said we need to have more discussions um i don't know what the solution is i'm as a journalist my i've been uh, my uh, i've spent my time asking the questions uh, and seeking answers from the uh, from the people and i hope i can uh, also learn uh, and and get as many answers i can from uh, from this discussion um gorov thank you thank you ranju uh, for your insightful uh, comments and uh, your perspective as a journalist uh, in arunachal pradesh i would like to now uh, introduce uh, dr dhanshi jaira who is a professor at uh, the department of geopolitics and international relations at manipal academy of higher education dr jairam holds a phd uh specializing on military dimensions of, of environmental security uh her area of expertise includes uh, environmental security and politics india's climate and environmental policy and diplomacy renewable politics and governance climate change and energy security the role of military in environmental security and governance environmental peace building and theories of international relations and uh, dr jaira i would like to welcome you to the discussion and would like to hear your comments uh on this particular matter over to you yeah thank you thank you so much uh i hope i'm audible um yes i yeah, i hope so yes, you are you are you are audible all right thank you so much uh so uh, after having heard all the my previous uh, uh, panelists uh, who have made excellent comments on so many issues regarding china's hydropower strategy not just uh, in this region but also southeast asia and also south america uh, there are so many examples to go by uh, what i'm going to do in my uh, presentation or my uh, my small little intervention would be to look at uh, china's notions of uh, a uh, comprehensive national power which is something that i think we should look into to understand the chinese perspective on their uh, on their rights to you know the waters of the tibetan plateau in particular which they consider as their inalienable right uh, secondly i would also look at the long term strategy of china which is i think very important to discuss because the kind of engineering projects that china is implementing uh, and the pace at which they are going about it is something that also gives some sort of signal about where china wants to head uh, with in terms of its uh, policies on water energy climate change and all these different issues that are interconnected with each other uh, so first of all thank you uh, for uh, uh, inviting me as i uh, as i already mentioned to this uh, to this panel with esteemed speakers uh who have given such a great overview of the topic so my job becomes some somewhat easier now because i i would be just giving like like i said more of a futuristic perspective on this issue looking at the large scale engineering projects that china is uh planning uh so to start with uh, as i as i mentioned uh, comprehensive national power so this is something that is very important to study because this is very different from the western notions of power or national power um uh, and the way other countries would perceive power you know so what is national power for, for the chinese if you read some of the english version articles that have been shared by think tanks and uh, academies and everything you would see that it actually means the total of the powers or strengths of a country in economics military affairs science and technology education resources and influence 
So as you can see, it covers like a vast gamut of issues. Uh, moreover, natural resources are a very important part of this comprehensive national power. So somewhat what uh, Sri Parna mentioned about uh, Sanza and uh, other like Confucian thought as well, which actually talks very, very uh, categorically about control of nature, something that uh, the Chinese are very much uh, entitled to. Uh, control of nature is something at the center of its comprehensive national power as well. So natural resources, whether it is arable land, access to fresh water, energy sources, Critical minerals, all these are part of its comprehensive national power. So uh, it does not come as a surprise that China wants to use this to enhance its comprehensive national power at the international level on the way to becoming a superpower or whatever in terms of the great power dynamics that currently exist in the international system. Coming to, uh, you know, what what was also previously discussed, uh, I think uh, Mr. Ering talked about it, Honorable Mr. Ering talked about it, so did Sri Parna, uh, 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 about, about the fact that the diversion part, so I think the dams and everything else others have mentioned, maybe I sh I'll directly go into some of the planned projects, some of it may sound completely outlandish, uh, in fact, some of the Chinese scientists themselves call it rogue science, with huge ecological uh, consequences and uh, no technical feasibility and all of that. That is how a lot of Chinese scientists themselves talk about some of these planned projects of China, uh, which is a part of the South-North water diversion. Um, I mean, I, I actually wanted to share uh, a particular, just, I just have one slide actually. Uh, if I can just show that, that, I, that would be perfect. Um, okay. there as well uh, is a massive part of this project because as I mentioned, uh, I mean, I read this quote somewhere mentioned by a Chinese official that the Tibetan plateau is a very important shelter to safeguard China's environment and ecological system. It has a bearing on the atmospheric circulation, climate patterns over the plateau and its surrounding regions. Therefore, it plays an important role in water source supply and conservation. So that is the interest that China has in the Tibetan plateau, uh, which of course is something I mean, Tibetan plateau should not be considered a Chinese uh, heritage only. It is a heritage of this entire region, considering uh, there are there is there are millions of people who are dependent on the waters that flow down uh, from the Tibetan plateau itself. But for the for the Chinese, it is purely Chinese territory, right? So that that is something that you know, uh, as a very state centric perspective on uh, on transboundary waters becomes highly problematic. Now. Coming to, as I mentioned, the large scale engineering projects and the control of nature. So, you know, because of the technical feasibility associated with diversion projects, what is also interesting to note is that now China is trying to modify weather and transfer water from one river to another by, you know, water vapor and all of that things as well. So, uh, I don't know if you have read about this project called Tianhe. It's uh, roughly translated as Sky River uh, with the Chinese, uh, with uh, Chinese universities, Chinese defense contractors are involved in implementing that project for a while. It is not yet completed. Uh, but in the meantime, China also came up with this announcement in December that it plans to uh, it plans to implement this large scale weather modification project, which would be almost 1.5 times the size of India. Uh, by 2025, it would cover like 5.5 million square kilometers receiving artificial rainfall, maybe also creating this air corridor instead of creating water corridors, yet they're trying to create air corridors by 
uh, transferring water from the Yangtze River to the more parched Yellow River. All of that is something that they have all, already been planning, but not much has been written about it. Not much information has been coming out of it, except a few Chinese scientists again have called it rogue science, phantom science and all of that. But yeah, it, it is happening. It is something that the state council themselves have said uh, uh, in 2020. Um, which is for artificial rainfall and hail suppression. Mainly, again, it is for their own national interest, whether it is for drought control or hail suppression, for agricultural purposes, ecological protection, to prevent forest fires, to control floods. All these different aspects of ecological security are something they are interested in uh, working out. Uh, so this project is very, very, very interesting. If you, if someone wants to look up, uh, this is something, you know, at, at once when you read it, you find it crazy. But yes, this is something they are looking at and weather modification, as I said already, is something they are looking at. Uh, almost 500 fuel burning chambers, for instance, have been set up uh, by uh, China in the Tibetan uh, Qinghai Plateau as well. So that, that's something to look out for. Um, so uh, just to, uh, just to end my end my intervention here, just talk about you know the uh, climate change part which Sri Parna also brought up. It's interesting to note that China is also investing in geoengineering, climate engineering projects to a much lesser extent as compared to the Western countries, but they are doing that now. We don't know what would be the impacts of these kind of technologies, uh, whether it's more weather modification. Or solar radiation management, carbon dioxide removal. Now, since China has said it would go carbon neutral by 2060, how is it going to achieve it? Is it just about hydropower, solar power, wind power, or is it also going to implement other kinds of projects to achieve its climate targets, right? So that is something that uh, we need to look at it. Um, and so all these technologies that are now part of the Chinese strategy also should you know, uh, ideally raise some questions as to how they're going about it and whether that would have an impact on this entire region, South and Southeast Asia, as well as other regions that are dependent, like I said, on um, uh, on the waters of the Tibetan Plateau, as well as, as I mentioned, like these kind of uh, projects also will have an impact on the, on the rainfall patterns, may have an impact because there is a lot of uncertainty, scientific uncertainty regarding the impact on rainfall patterns and all of that as well. So these, these things uh, have to be discussed. Another very important part here is to discuss Chinese obligations towards international law. Somebody mentioned that, okay, yeah, you know, uh, there is uh, an MOU. Uh, on data uh, sharing on hydrological data, but of course, uh, Chinese did not share data with India uh, during the Doklam standoff, right? So that happened. Um, similarly, yes, uh, uh, the peaceful, uh, sorry, the military use of such technologies, as I mentioned, may be prohibited by UN conventions to which China is um, a member. China has ratified, for instance, um, the Environmental Modification Convention, which states that no country should use this technology for military purposes. But the problem is, it is kind of silent about the peaceful use of such technologies, which also may have, uh, you know, a long term impact on the rivers, on the ecosystems uh, and on uh, on the entire region as well. Similarly, China has also ratified the Convention on Biological Diversity, which also states that nothing should be done at the uh, national level, which would have an impact, say, on the regional level or transnational level. Uh, but does that mean China is going to uh, live up to that? I'm not sure, even if it has signed up to these international treaties, right? Because we have seen that China has openly gone against some of these international conventions as well in the past. So looking at this kind of uh, very, uh, very bleak kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, environment, we what we can do, I mean, of course, this has been mentioned by the others as well, is to kind of ramp up... Uh, uh, cooperation with our neighbors in South Asia, Southeast Asia, to get them to talk to China more and more about not just the short and medium term strategies of China that may have an impact on us, also the long term strategies like by 2035, they want to advance their weather modification technology to the greatest level, uh, you know, comparable to some of the Western countries. If that is the plan, uh, because of the geographical contiguity that we share, we also have to be concerned about the impact of these policies uh, on the water sources, on the ecosystems and other uh, other factors which are kind of shared. They are shared heritage in the end. So I'll stop there. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 
Dr. Jairam uh, for a very detailed uh, uh, presentation and explanation of uh, this particular issue. Uh, I would now like to actually, uh, we have Dr. John Nomikos with us, uh, a renowned intellectual as well as uh, an expert on security matters. Uh, Dr. Nomikos, if uh, we can have you speak uh, on this issue and share your thoughts uh, with the yeah. panelists as well as with the audience. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, even though I'm not a specialist on the uh, Chinese and India relation, um, in the Research Institute for European American Studies that uh, I'm directing, we have an India scholar, um, uh, Mrs. Ragini Sharma, uh, who contributed uh, 10 days ago an article about China territorial claim and Aru, Aruna, Arunakal uh, Pradesh, the northeast uh, frontier state of India. Uh, and then this uh, our India colleges, uh, you know, in Greece uh, introduce uh, uh, the area that you are discussing today. So this is good for us because uh, myself, I was not familiar with that. Uh, but now I had the chance, you know, uh, Mr. Ajan allowed me to be in this uh, in this forum, and I learned a lot, a lot, many things about the dispute, a uh, water conflict uh, between India and China, which is uh, immediately comes to my mind uh, the same problem we face in Turkey and Syria, because we have, you know, the Euphrates uh, River, you have, you know, the Tiger uh, River. Uh, I saw, you know, the war um, Chinese uh, Tiger River. So as you can see, the problem you are facing uh, in your area, it's more or less the same one uh, parallel, you know, and compared to Syria and Turkey. And what I want to say is that uh, sometimes the Turkish government regime, uh, the Erdogan regime, really blackmail. Uh, by blocking the water, you know, flow uh, to north of Syria and to, you know, Kurdistan. Uh, this could be a blow up issues in the, in the coming, uh, in the coming months because uh, the, the water is an emerging um, issues, you know, for military conflict uh, between Syria and uh, Turkey because uh, uh, the Syrians are suffering from the lack of water that is coming from Turkey. So uh, the water policy from uh, Erdogan is creating a lot of uh, uh, deterioration and the, uh, and the standard of life for Syria and the Kurds. And the Kurds, you know, are really upset about the water policy coming from uh, Erdogan regime, which I see in many similarities, Mr. Rajan, with uh, uh, between India and uh, Pakistan. The other issue is, uh, you know, in Akuya, which is the southern part of Turkey, they try to have a nuclear, uh, a nuclear, you know, power um, reactor there. And of course, they receive a lot of uh, nuclear expertise from Pakistan and from China. So as you can see, you know, the situation uh, that we are facing here right now, it could, uh, you know, be, it has to be under control. Otherwise, it will be very, unstable to us uh, related to the dispute border. And I'm sure that uh, they view the United States, especially the state of Israel, the Jewish state would not allow uh, uh, Turkey to go on with a nuclear uh, reactor in the uh, southern part of Turkey across Cyprus, Greece, and Israel. But at the same time, this uh, water policy uh, by the Erdogan regime, which is a lot of similarity with the India and China, they're, you know, of course, like uh, it's, uh, two major powers there. Uh, but uh, it, it is good for us in, in, in South Europe uh, to be introduced uh, to your, uh, uh, to this China territorial claim on Arunachal uh, Pradesh uh, and uh, to be known uh, in Europe uh, and the United Nations, in the United States, because we see how many case studies uh, is are very, very much similar. And sometimes between Turkey and Syria, uh, the situation is fluid, but uh, we, are there, we are looking for best practices. So a good best practices could be uh, how India handled uh, the Chinese you know, territorial claim on this area. So that's what I want to say. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be in this um, uh, good forum and to be able to understand the, uh, more about uh, your uh, about the, the geopolitical, the geoeconomic issues and the water policy in, in your area. Thank you very much, Mr. Raja.
Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. John. Uh, uh, I would like to now actually uh, go to the chat box. Uh, there are a lot of interesting comments there. Uh, Mr. Ivan, of course, Professor Ivan uh, mentions about the need to form an international coalition, uh, primarily between India and the United States, uh, to ensure that uh, the aggressiveness of China is checked. And also we have a new president at the White House. Uh, Dr. Ivan, my question to you, we have a new president at the White House. Uh, you know, his One of his campaign promise was building a secure Indo-Pacific region as well as putting a lot of attention to climate change and environmental matters. And what China is doing possesses a serious threat to the environmental uh, security of, uh, of this particular terrain. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, on, on these and what do you think uh, both the administration can do uh, to collaborate to ensure that the Chinese uh, uh, are kept in control with regards to the dams they are, that they're building in uh, Tibet? Sure. No, thanks for the question. Well, first of all, just as a disclaimer, I, I can't uh, tell you what U.S. policy definitively is or, or will be yet, but, but I think we can read certain things from uh, who and, as you pointed out, uh, some of the commitments that have been made. Um, first of all, just recognizing the orientation of, of the team. I mean, if you look at uh, you know people like uh, you know Tony Blinken, if you look at uh, you know people like Jake Sullivan on the National Security Council, um, if you look at people like the appointment of, of a coordinating um, you know basically czar for Indo-Pacific issues, uh, Kirk Campbell, whom I've worked with and have a, a great deal of respect for. Um, I think what you see is, is a commitment to looking at the strategic issues of the region, a continued commitment to looking at, at, at India and broader collaboration between not only the U.S. and India, but um, you know, the, uh, the other uh, states of the region. So I think these these are precisely the type of issues where there's um, you know, possibility of multilateral uh, collaboration. And you may mention an interesting issue that uh, this is the type of issue that brings in brings together strategic equities environmental issues and in, in others and so um you know there are multiple reinforcing things i think bring the us and india um to find ways to co cooperate here and i just want to mention I, I think there's two dimensions that at least could be possible or should be possible um you know first of all the us and india working together in a variety of multilateral forums um so i mean you have united nations forums you have technical various different technical forums and committees on on environmental issues and, and other things um but really you have a really a broader right of of, of what are our standards on you know water sharing and water use even without those other, and I think the, the common positions that are taken bring in a whole lot of other countries that are affected. Uh, is, is the last speaker just just mentioned the decisions that are taken here of affect a lot of things that even go beyond just China, India, or even beyond just China's use of water with all the surrounding states. But I think also I, I want to go look at this also in the way in which this issue impacts. Um, kind of push back against China's expansion more broadly because it is about the water and how that affects India. But it's also, it signals as, because China is strategically dependent on international compliance and, and goodwill to get partner nations to go along with it, to um, to say, okay, we'll, we'll let you in on this project, we will, uh, on this loan project, we will collect cooperate with you in, in this way. And China manages very effectively its strategic communications and its discourse. I mean, the references to the Global Times comments. Um, but in many ways, this illustrates in, in difficult to deny ways the things that we also have seen, for example, in China's activities in the South and East China Sea with basically um, ignoring the, the UNCLOS um, you know, stipulations about, you know, what its territorial waters are, that, that basically again and again, I mean, you see, uh, you know, China essentially, um, you know, doing what it wants, especially when it's in its interest, bullying smaller partners, um, you know, sharing or a fail, failure to share information or maintaining a, a, a discourse that's completely different from what is actually happening. And so I think this creates when I, what I've seen in Latin America is is when one makes these big enough talking points, when one really pushes this, it in some ways forces China to modify its behavior because it's not just this issue where maybe China can say, well, we don't have to care about what India says. You can't make us. But um, when these types of bad behaviors become significant liabilities for China's ability to get international cooperation and a lot of other economic things which are central to its you know, continued modernization, then it has been forced in other forums to kind of back off a little bit, if, if only to 
try to manage its image to try to prevent that from becoming a liability and achieving its economic objective. So I think both in the multilateral forums and really making this talking point in a broader international discourse, um, clearly there are ways that the U.S. and India can, and, and I personally believe should, uh, collaborate on this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Even. I would now actually like to uh, you know, put a question to uh, Mr. Ehring, the Honorable MLA from Paksi Ghat. On, um, these are questions basically on the comments on how India and Bangladesh primarily can come together to create uh, you know, a multilateral forum uh, for water sharing and as Dr. Even, Ivan, Ivan said, uh, pressurize China you know, to behave, uh, uh, to behave uh, properly with regards to water sharing and you know, with the lower uh, riparian states. Uh, Mr. Ehring, in case you were there. I think... Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Ehring, are you there? Yeah, 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 I'm there, I'm there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you get the question? Yeah, I got it. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really pleased with, uh, you know, the knowledge uh, I've got uh, uh, by all this discussion. I'm really grateful to all of you, you know, in managing all the, especially Dhanshri ji, and uh, they have really spoken in details, and uh, uh, I'm really pleased uh, that, yes, we can do something about it and go forward. I'm really pleased with uh, uh, the question also, that uh, what we should do, uh, the, after the, all the floods that have occurred, after all the devastation and uh, the way we could not control this river and how China is playing with the, with the ecological system, the whole uh, construction of the dams, the whole atmosphere is being changed. Of course, uh, I don't know if these technical terms are, you know, it's uh, just a French to me. Uh, but uh, if it is true, means uh, uh, they have very much advanced in their uh, technical knowledge and we have a lot to learn from them. Uh, they may be our adversaries, but still, if anything positive, we have to learn from them. But uh, like, as you said, uh, it is not only Bangladesh, it is not only India that has to you know, come forward. Uh, like we were always just discussing about uh, the Mekong River how the whole of Southeast Asian countries, Cambodia, Vietnam, everybody has been, uh, you know, affected by the Chinese, uh, you know, the control of the river. If they, especially after construction of this dam, I don't think Bangladesh also will be, you know, uh, able to, uh, you know, face uh, the water scarcity that is going to take place. Uh, we have to be very firm. We have to come together. We have to get all the a nations together that they have to protect us and we have to really like my friend uh, who was uh, Dr. just saying a journalist that uh, we have to uh, speak it out in uh, Delhi and uh, that stepmotherly treatment must not be there for Arunachal Pradesh we must come forward and uh, really uh, we hope that uh, our Honorable Prime Minister Mr. Narendra uh, Modi let us hope that uh, he thinks positive uh, and this discussion, I'm sure that we should even uh, give it in the social media. It should go even to the uh, PMO. And then uh, they should know that what is really happening on the ground in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, I'm really thankful to all of you. And uh, I'm sure uh, the technical experts are so good that they know more about uh, the Siang Vihewa than me. Because even though I'm here, I don't know what is happening on the other side uh, of the border. But here, through all your technical, uh, you know, know-how and how you have spoken, I'm really pleased that I could also uh, know about what is going on the other side of our border. So thank you, and uh, let us hope that uh, we all we meet again in a, in good times and uh, discuss it in a larger sphere. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ehring. Uh, final uh, comments, of course. Uh, would like to. Uh, there have been a uh, lot of people have commented on the chat box. Uh, I would like to actually uh, maybe put one question to 
Dr. Batok, and I'm sure uh, she is here. Um, I'm here. Yeah, Dr. Patak, of course, so we have had uh, a lot of engagement from you know, different participants today. Uh, but just a general question, uh, we do know that there is, uh, you know, there are no comprehensive bilateral agreements between India and China when it comes to water, uh, except, of course, data sharing, for which, of course, India pays a hefty amount of money. Uh, in case we have to look at from an international law point of view, what can India do? Uh, uh, to put uh, to to of course bring China to an international forum or force China to come to an international forum to ensure compliance um, with regards to whatever they are committing um, in public that they will not use the dams for anything apart from run of the river or for any other geological warfare point of view. Uh, Okay, so, um, you know, China, as Dhanashri said, has signed a lot of these um, agreements, but then will it really adhere to these agreements? That's a big question. It does not really do so. Um, one example being of that, you know, the Hague Tribunal, where it just, it just questioned the um, rationale for the existence of the Hague Tribunal. So China's approach has been that it joins these, um, you know, democratic or liberal institutions in the international realm, but does not really adhere to the norms when it is at the receiving end. It would try to use these laws and norms against democratic countries because, you know, we adhere to... But it does not adhere to these. So how do we bring it to task? What do we really do about it? First is um, we need to get more countries on board. There is a need for awareness creation. You know, even a lot of people, even within India, do not know about what is happening in the northeastern states. Water does not figure as a major issue. You know, when we are talking about India-China issues. Um, First of all, create awareness. Secondly, the you know take take a leaf out of China's the way China um, uses these international forums to you know um, push against us. Raise these issues at each and every forum, even if it's a minuscule issue. China always threatens to drag India at some international forum. You know, they will talk about Kashmir. I'm just moving away from water, maybe, but you know this is something which we also start need to doing. Talk about it more and more often. And as Dhanashri said, and Dhanashri has more expertise in that arena, um, you know, take look at some of these agreements which China has signed, be it on biodiversity or against, you know, the military usage of um, these uh, resources and try and see what can be done. You know, China knows how to use the nomenclature. If it's something that, you know, um, military usages of these resources, we are using it for peaceful purposes. You know, get together with like-minded nations and find out what could be done, you know, um, because this is clearly for, for, for very ulterior motives. Even though they claim it is for peaceful purposes, it is actually creating a lot of devastation, you know. So how could it be peaceful? So uh, these are some of the things which I think we could do. But from a more legal perspective, I think Dhanashri would be the better person. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patak. Uh, final comments, uh, Dr. Jairam, uh, on this entire discussion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I think the uh, Ivan has put one question as well, which kind of uh, ties good well with uh, Sri Parna's uh, last comment as well. Um, and I, I think that's the concern here. So if you're looking at, I, I'm not per se an expert in international law, but I look at environmental uh, issues, environmental global environmental governance of which laws are an important part. Uh, so just looking at uh, China's adherence to laws, international laws or international institutions, international norms, like Sri Parna said, of course, it does it only when it's it's convenient to China. It, it you know does not really adhere to everything. But in regard to some of these laws, now one of the problems is there is a transboundary reverse convention of which neither China nor India, not pa Bangladesh, nor Pakistan, none of these countries are signatories to this transboundary reverse convention, which is again part of the UN, right? So there are a lot of countries which are not part of it. Uh, so again, so there is no obligation on the part of uh, the Chinese or, mm, or the Indians or anyone to adhere to these norms. 
uh, when it comes to uh, like i said the the military use of um, uh, you know technologies or weather modification kind of technologies of course china has ratified it but like i said again there the law is kind of very silent when it comes to peaceful use of the same technology which can be dual use and of course it can be used for strategic purposes because in the end for china water is a strategic asset it wants to be able to use at any point in time for bargaining or for arm twisting or whatever that is so that's another problem if you're going to next level technologies like geoengineering and other kinds of technologies like solar geoengineering climate engineering now there again there is a huge problem because as of now there is no uh, un uh, like geoengineering governance right now so you know countries have not agreed upon any governance mechanism on geoengineering so far so yes so again china gets like a clean slate over there it can do whatever it wants as of now because there are no laws that guide or kind of give any norms as to how these technologies can be used or deployed or even for that matter what kind of research has to be conducted on it a lot of small countries a lot of european countries in particular have been asking have been calling on uh, the big countries to look at this issue very seriously because it looks like in another 10 years uh, climate engineering technologies are going to be the thing because that's the only way to sort of you know deal with climate change in the long run so that's that's another problem so like like um, like china has completely in, ignored the un clause rulings uh, it looks like even on other issues even if china uh, the, i mean you know ratifies these new laws or existing laws or whatever it doesn't look like it's going to uh, adhere to it Uh, uh and you know there is always there is always the problem with international law in terms of sovereignty right uh, so if there is something happening at the domestic level uh, within the territorial boundaries it's not a problem it's only if it affects the transnational um kind of uh, ecosystems it affects the other countries but for that like sri parna mentioned the other countries have to come together on a massive level uh, like minded countries neighboring countries all the countries that are going to be affected by it uh have to come together to create knowledge first of all as to what kind of impacts these uh, technologies could have and uh, secondly you know creating some kind of um working groups or some kind of in even if it's informal kind of groups that's enough it doesn't have to be because you know even if it's formal groups i don't i i don't completely buy that china would in the end comply with any of the any of the you know demands that are put forth by these countries so we may have to go with anything that is available to us right now to at least prevent china from taking unilateral actions without taking uh, the other countries also into confidence yeah thank you so much uh, dr jayaram with this uh, i'd like to conclude uh, of course today's uh, very insightful and an engaging discussion i'd like to hand over the mic uh, to ms sheetal sinha because from a red lantern analytica to deliver the vote of thanks uh, uh, over thank to ms sinha thank you so much gaurav um, a warm and cherished good evening to everyone who are present here I'm Shreethal Sinha, a research scholar and head of communications and outreach at Red Lantern Analytica. It is my privilege to propose a word of thanks and acknowledgement to the contribution of everyone who made today's webinar a success. On behalf of Red Lantern Analytica, I would like to thank our esteemed guest speakers, Mr. Ninong Ering, Dr. Evan Ilis, Dr. Dhana Shri uh, Jaya Ram, Dr. Shri Parna Patak, Mr. Ranju Dodam. all of who spend their busiest time in gracing this webinar with their valuable insights and in enlightening us with their knowledge it surely gave us something to think about and dig deeper into the topic and also reveal some interesting facts about china's hydropower strategy i like to thank our moderator for the evening gaurav desh gupta for the smooth proceedings of this webinar and mr abhishek ranjan sir without whom this webinar wouldn't be possible I'd also like to thank Bhavdeep Modi, though he couldn't be here today, but his contributions were instrumental. Get well soon, Bhavdeep. I'd like to thank the Red Lantern Analytica team for always being enthusiastic and proactive at each and every step of the way. I'd like to thank John Homikos for joining us today and giving us an impromptu presentation. Last but not the least, I'd like to extend my heartiest appreciation to our viewers. We hope to bring more of such penetrative discussions to your screens. Thank you, and we hope you all have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you Dinong sir. Thank you Dhansri. Thank you Shiparna ji. Bye. We will end the session now.
Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks.